With us today, we have the Athletics Tottenham correspondent Jack Pittsbrook and also German football writer Seb Stafford Blue. And also, Seb, welcome. First time I've seen you in the flesh. So good to have you in with us. Thanks for having me, Ari. All right, let's let, let's talk Ange Postacoglu because uh, Spurs writer Charlie Eccleshear has written a really good piece actually available to read on the Athletic today, comparing Ange's first 26 games to that of Arteta and also um, Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool. Now, if we look at the point tallies in particular, Ange's team has actually tallied more than the other two. I mean, that's quite encouraging at this moment in time, isn't it, Jack, do you reckon? Yeah, it's really encouraging. I think what that po- what that piece makes very clear is that people kind of memory hole mm-hmm. how long it took for both Klopp's Liverpool and Arteta's Arsenal to actually get good. Um, and because they're so good now, we assume that it was almost kind of overnight. But in fact, it took li- years, like literally mm-hmm. years and years and windows and money to get to that point. Now, it's Im- impossible to predict at right now how good Ange's Tottenham are going to be, but we can see by the fact that they are outperforming those two teams at, at an equivalent stage that they are on, on a really good track at the moment. And so if they, I guess the question is, can they, can they do the things that Liverpool and Arsenal did which allowed them to continue to grow and improve mm. and actually get to that sort of top level of competitiveness? Yeah, um, in terms of points, let me just read them out. Ange... After 26 games, 50 points, Klopp 43, Arteta 42. Seb, should we be a bit more realistic, though? Um, in terms of the different factors in which, you know, the managers came into the club, you know, I, I think Ange has technically had a pre-season and, you know, going into a full season, the other two came halfway through the season. But also, I think we were saying just before, Mikel Arteta, that's his first managerial um, position, really, obviously, under Pep Guardiola, who's a the guru but should those be taken into consideration yeah I I think they have to be because anytime you have a pre-season you at least in theory have the chance to design the squad around what you want Um, and clearly Postacoglu had that opportunity perhaps it didn't go quite as far as a lot of supporters wanted it to in terms of equipping the squad with depth but look at the investment that was made over the summer Mickey van der Ven to me is the big one um, who I just think is a phenomenal centre-half in the making I remember watching him in Germany and thinking it's going to be a bit of a liability for a few years. He's well exceeded my expectations. Um, but then you see kind of James Madison coming in, and I, I, Madison seems to be so fundamental to the kind of football that Postacoglu wants to play in the final third. Not necessarily the build up, but kind of the cutting angles, the use of the kind of the wide forwards. Um, that it's a luxury to have those players. And, and sort of also, you have the opportunity to lay a few other seeds you, you have the opportunity to go away and go on tour to develop a little bit of a social connection whereas I suppose if you come in halfway through a season you inherit a group of players who are disaffected with the previous manager mm-hmm. so um, at Liverpool Brennan, Brennan Rogers, um, and a lot of the kind of the initial weeks in the first season is about sort of I don't know like each group working towards each other and you don't have to do that mid-season in Postacoglu's case so there is a difference and I, I do think there's an asterisk there but I, I remember reading Charlie's article and I was quite surprised um, and I, I still think it's a really significant achievement because I think a lot of people because the turnaround has been so quick a lot of people have forgotten how bad it was at Spurs mm-hmm. last season and how mm-hmm. how joyless it was, how creatively, uh, what's the word, I, anemic, I would say. Toxic. <laughs> it's really bad as a yeah. fan. Also, as a fan who lives abroad, I don't think I'd ever felt further away from the football team. So for, for Postacoglu to come in and, and cure those things as well as make the team better, I feel is um, that's, that's an asterisk on the other side, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I guess, Jack, you know, should we look at that in terms of where the club was before he came in, right? Like the fan base weren't that happy with previous management. And I guess his job really was sort of just to stabilise it for the time being. But actually he's done more than that. Yeah, exactly. Like I think the main the main job that I think Postacoglu had to do this season was to bring all the disparate parts of the football club back mm. together. So what we saw last year was huge amounts of friction between the management, the fan base the football club and the and the players and so Ange has really sh- sorry let me say that again mm-hmm. and what Ange has done is he's shown that if you have a popular charismatic manager with a clear set of ideas then all those different parts of the club can come together behind that manager that was really the main job that he had for this season I think that's really the, the main reason they specifically brought him in because they knew that he could drive that kind of cultural change he could he could transform the ethos of the football club. 
And so that's he's already ticked that box, really. And I think what they've done on the pitch, which has been very impressive, that was always not so much like a, I don't want to say it, was, it wasn't a priority this season, because of course it is, but it was... I think fundamentally what he's going to be judged on is that kind of ethos, cultural stuff. And he's and he's done so well on that on that case already. Uh, and I think the football is already exceeding expectations. I, I honestly think that's the, the vital ingredient uh, as far as Jack's hit the nail on the head. As a fan, I don't care so much about whether they end up winning the Premier League or FA Cups or mm. qualifying for the Champions League. What matters to me is that I can grasp an idea, a central idea at the club and a journey that we're all heading on where the club is getting better, things are evolving, pieces are being put around a manager. That's what I want. The idea that there's a long-term strategy, there's something for me to believe in. I, I think that goes right to the core of fandom mm -hmm. in football for, because a lot of people know at the beginning of their football fan life that they're never going to win anything. They're never going to have that ultimate moment, right? So if you don't have that, you need to have aspiration. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what Postacoglu has brought. Like, this is someone that is very optimistic, even um, when we need to hear him speak, yes, but also uh, his his brand of football is, you know, very optimistic. And, and some people say probably, you know, to a fault. But that's what I want as a fan, the idea that we are heading somewhere. I don't know where it's going to be, but we're heading somewhere. Do you agree with that, Jack, in terms of, you know, if he does get Champions League football this season, that'd be amazing, right? And I know... In terms of building something, that, that makes a lot of sense. But, I mean, what fan doesn't want to be travelling to Real Madrid next season? Yeah, I mean, of course, every fans want the team to do as well as possible. But I think what why I agree with Seb is what sets this season apart from the last few is that the success on the pitch is kind of downstream from the mm. overall sense of strategy mm. at the club. Whereas the problem that they'd had for really the last five years since they sat at Pochettino in 2019 is this idea that they could basically cut, kind of cut out the idea of having a strategy. Or rather, sorry, the strategy basically in the last five years was we'll get a famous manager in mm. and that famous manager has won stuff before and his kind of winningness will rub off on us and we'll be good instantly. Yeah. And that's what they tried with Mourinho and it failed and they tried it with Conte and it also failed. Um, and this year they've kind of, they've realised that they had things in the wrong order, but they've got the order correct again now. You start with the ethos and then the football, hope, the success on the pitch will hopefully come after that. Mm. Um, so of course fans want the team to do well. And I think the team probably will do well in the medium term, but it's about understanding kind of fundamentally what makes the team succeed. And it's, and it's not just about having a famous manager. Yeah, I just want to pick up on something you wrote about, um, Jack, in terms of... Um something that could be seen as a as a factor in halting Spurs' progress is this idea that, you know, Spurs are conceding a fair bit um, under Postacoglu. This sort of front foot football does come with its dangers as well. But I'll also caveat that, and we spoke about this, you know, not long ago when we were speaking about um, teams that have given Manchester City a game. Spurs went to Manchester City, scored three goals with Roy Allen Davies as centre-back. So, you know, he, he's adaptable as well. Yeah, so basically Tottenham's... Uh, this is a piece I did last week mm. looking at how high Tottenham's expected goals against is this season. And it's really high. You know, it's more than... It's, I mean, it's, I think it was kind of 1.74 a game. It's probably come down a little bit since I wrote that. But that's kind of more than, just under double what it was in the peak years of Pochettino. So clearly the team is, it's not a perfect team yet. And it's a team which has got some flaws. But what I was, what I'm really interested in having, when I wrote this piece was the question of, to what extent is this defensive frailty? Is this kind of inherent within Ange Ball? Is this a feature of Ange Ball? Or is it just a bug? Is it just a temporary issue mm. caused by the massive injury crisis that they suffered in November? And actually, the more I think about it, the more I think it's not like an inherent problem with his strategy. It's more that if you're going to play this way, you really need all your best players to be available. Mm. And I think he's asked so much of them this season that at times... Yeah. They have the players he's had available to him haven't quite been able to execute the, the plans. When you dug into it, Jack, did you find like a lot of individual mistakes at the kind of the heart of some of those those concessions? The most interesting thing I found is that set piece set pieces play a huge role in this. Like Tottenham, are, I think they were the fourth worst in the league on 
set piece expect a goal against but really that that kind of sits slightly separately from open play and you think yeah. it's the kind of thing that again it's not really inherent to the style of play it's the kind of thing that ideally you would imagine they could kind of coach to be better at mm. so and I do think also individual mistakes play a role as well um and if but if you look at the numbers from say the first 10 games of the season when obviously they won eight drew two started the season really really well and again had Romero and Van der Ven playing together at centre back for those games the, the defensive numbers are pretty good they weren't yeah. as good as City and Arsenal but they were I think kind of sixth best on expected goals against at that point and in the last few weeks since they've had Romero and Van der Ven back together again the the numbers have been good like I mean Palace Palace against Tottenham on Saturday afternoon had the lowest expected goals of any team who's played against Tottenham this season. And I, th- I mean, I know they, they scored a goal with Ezzy's brilliant free kick, mm. but that was kind of yeah. came out of nowhere. But if, but to me, that suggests that it is possible for Tottenham to achieve good defensive numbers playing this way. But clearly, they need all their best players available, and they need to be playing at a high level. Mm. From your perspective, sir, do you think that? And I think you guys have both alluded to it. It's that this feels like a, a long-term project. This doesn't feel like a situation where if he doesn't get Champions League football, you're out the door, mate. Because actually what he seems to be building is stronger than, you know, potentially winning something. But not just that. It's very rare to get someone that connects the fans and the management and the board together. Yeah, but also to improve individual players so dramatically. Like if you go around the Tottenham team or squad as a whole, you look at sort of expectations back in probably June, July with the group of players that were pretty much in in place. And Mm -hmm. a lot of people have said, I think I said seventh, eighth, you know, with that group would be a pretty decent return as long as we play some pretty football. But then you look at the the evolution in people like Pap Sarr is the one who I think is, I've loved watching him. I think he's fantastic. Um, Yves Basuma before Christmas and before his suspensions and um, before he went off to AFCON. Um, Mickey van der Ven, we've talked about. I think um, Romero has, not sure what the right way to characterize it, but has grown up a little bit and has has, has kind of developed into a a really, really top-class defender. But Pedro Porro, Destiny Doggy, like everywhere you go, there is an improvement. Richarlison, for instance. People, a lot of people gave up on Richarlison, I think, um, probably by about September, October. We, you know, And there seems to be this ability where he can cope with that and he can move players on either to a kind of a, a sorry for, for using the phrase, better moment, as football parlance goes now, but also to a point where like, you can see a, 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 a point in the future where the team as a whole is growing organically, which is really what you want is a kind of a, a little bit of a callback to Pochettino. And so I suppose that ties the bow quite neatly on Jack's point about mm-hmm. ethos around the team in that it's not just about get the famous guy in, hope for the jolt, hope that this this kind of magical Mourinho slash Conte quality turns your players who are semi-finalists into finalists mm-hmm. and winners. And that's the strategy. Now there seems to be something a little bit more coherent. Some of those individual improvements are almost unbelievable Sar is this season unbelievable. So, so how many Spurs yeah. fans would have said at the start of the season that Saar would be yeah. I think arguably that I think I mean you, you can argue whether Madison or Saar is more important but they are Tottenham's two most important midfielders mm. they're, they're the two guys they cannot cope without in the middle of the pitch how many people would have said that Saar would be that 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 integral to the team yeah. Saar is now miles ahead of Hoiberg in the pecking order, Skip, Skip in the pecking yeah, order, who many yeah. people thought was the future Tottenham's midfield, and is now you know a very able replacement, but he's not a first a first pick player. Porro is someone who, when they signed him, lots of people, probably me included, were saying, "Well, he played as a wing back at Sport at Sporting. He can't play in a back four. I think I said that yeah. on a podcast at some point. The one the one game he played in the back four last um, last season, remember, was at Newcastle United, where Stellini mm. just. So they decided to change the system. They lost. They put in one of the worst performances I've ever seen until this season's Sheffield United team. They lost six one, and then Stellini was sacked that evening. Um, and nobody thought that Porro could defend. Everybody would say, "Oh, Porro, good going forward, only as a wing back, can't defend in a four. Now this season, he's learned to play a completely new position. Basically, as this right back in a four who inverts into midfield. He's created tons of chances for Tottenham. He's played almost literally every minute until the other week where he finally missed a game. He's been, he's been brilliant in his improvement. Romero, as Seb says, I think Romero has been transformed by being handed the vice captaincy. People, you know, you hear a lot about how much more grown up he is, how he much more kind of buys into the, the team ethic. You can see that in his discipline as well. He's got that he got that red card at, in the Chelsea game in November.
remember for a stupid tackle. But generally speaking, I think he's been better. He's been, yes. he hasn't made so many mistakes. And again, with Charlton as well, like you mm. said, like he's he's got he's got ten league goals this season so far. He's been on a fantastic run in the last few months. And you know, people might say, well, they've paid fifty million quid for him in the first place. You'd expect that. But the fact is, up until this this goal scoring run started, he'd barely scored for Tottenham. Mm. You know, people liked him as a character, but he just wasn't really delivering goal with, with goals. I think it's it, it, it's it's quite something to rescue a player from not just a bad like period of form, but what was apparently quite a bad personal moment in his life. So there are managers in the game today, all over the game, who when you have that, not my problem. Bring somebody in who's going to play well, uh, and you go you go and sort that out on your own time. I feel like Postecoglou took a bit of an ownership of the Richarlison situation, and it really is a feather in his cap to be able to turn something, a situation like that, into such a positive. Because without his goals, and actually, I, I'm going to go down the Soldado route um, from, from about 10 years ago, but without his work rate and contribution, I suppose we'd be in a very difficult, a very different place now. Okay. I think. Well, before we move on, quick public announcement. We're asking you to fill out a quick survey about you and your podcast habits by going to theathletic.com forward slash survey 24. Three lucky entries will win a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars worth of Amazon vouchers as well. So whether you're a long time listener or a new one, we want your feedback. I'm so interested from your perspective, what next season looks like. Let's say Spurs do get that top five spot and based on how things work out in the European European leagues, they do get a Champions League spot next season. What does that then look like for Spurs? Is it just to exist in these spaces and keep building? Or is there, to a certain expectation, an idea that we can go ahead and try and win something this year? Yeah, that, it's a really good question, and I don't really know what the strategic priorities will be. Um, obviously, it's very difficult to plan to win a cup competition. Mm-hmm. I mean, Spurs. This is something that Spurs have, have struggled with a lot over the years, as people, as everyone knows, is that you can be a really good team and not win a cup. Mm-hmm. Um, because cups are reliant so much on randomness, and you perform at the right times, and obviously even under you know under under Pochettino, Tottenham were unbelievably good, and they what they lost one League Cup final, one Champions League final, they screwed up two FA Cup semi finals yeah. along the way. Yeah. So I think it's very difficult to build around the idea of trying to win a trophy. What I, what I think I'm more interested in is how how much better can they get in the Premier League? Let's say they'll finish with they'll probably finish in the with the points total in around sort of 70, maybe maybe 75 this season, which is fantastic. That's going to be their best season in five years. What I wonder is, can they go and be a kind of 80 plus point team? Mm. And what would they need to do to be able to achieve that? I think if there's a cloud on the horizon, it's that obviously there are, there are areas in which the squad can be improved. I think that's still a really good group of players. Like clearly a little bit of depth is needed in certain positions and a slightly different type of centre forward and you know a couple of wide forwards in there that th- these are things which can move the needle a little bit but you wonder whether spurs have the resources to make the kind of signings that we we started by talking about Arteta and Klopp now mm-hmm. clearly both fantastic coaching jobs and um testament to their managerial abilities but nourished also by massive spending at really important moments. So Klopp wins a Champions League and a Premier League title because they're in a position to sign Virgil van Dijk and Alisson. So like premier players in their positions in the world. Now, can Spurs, I suppose that's where the, the glass ceiling is or the hump or whatever you want to describe it. That's that's the difference maker in modern football, that kind of expenditure. So I, I, it's really hard to, to tell. I'm enjoying watching it grow, mm-hmm. but I don't know, don't really get a sense for where it's going. But this is why I'm interested in terms of what, profile of player Spurs being bring in then um, over the summer because obviously this is still a rebuilding project let's not forget that it's only had one full season but you know let's say look at the Carabao Cup final Van Dijk scores the goal for, for Liverpool uh, a Chelsea team lacking real experience at that time ta- at that type of tournament or that stage in a tournament those kind of decisions and who you bring in will make a massive difference as to where you do end up at the end of the season. A hundred percent. And I think it's going to be, I imagine it will have to be more of a kind of a hybrid approach. So Spurs are economically in a situation where they should be prioritising a, a Lucas Bergval, mm-hmm. for instance, and, and investing his future as they have done with Destiny Dogi, who's 
I, I can't wait to see what kind of player he becomes. He's just already an excellent one. Pat Starr we've talked about. And so you, you have to kind of, you have to fuel both sides of it. So you have to make sure you, you're bringing in a James Madison and also ensuring that because you're a little bit of a financial, not a little bit, a big financial disadvantage to Manchester City, Paris Saint-Germain, et cetera, et cetera, um, you have to have players before they become unavailable to you. Uh, and so that's a very difficult balance to find. But if uh, for a club like Spurs, the only way to succeed in the kind of material trophy sense is to nail both sides of that approach at the same time and be absolutely perfect. And it's that's tricky. I think what I'd add to that as well is that I think the landscape is much changing in Tottenham's favour because of uh, the Premier League's profit and sustainability rules. Like we, because to- because of Tottenham's. You- I was going to say unique model, but because of Tottenham's distinctive model, which is that they have the stadium which produces, let's say, five million pounds per home mm. game for them. Um, this this puts them in such a strong financial position, and and also they've had you know they've they've controlled their wage bill very well over the years mm. relative to their revenue. This puts them in a much stronger position with PSR than lots of their rivals, and we saw this in the January window where Tottenham were able to go and get drag us in from Genoa for twenty five million, while lots of their Premier League rivals were unable to do any business. Now, there's no reason to expect that that's going to change because the Tottenham Stadium is going to continue to bring in that money. Mm-hmm. The Tottenham wage bill is going to re- remain relatively low. Tottenham have quite a lot of headroom with PSR that other teams don't. And so I think that even though in the past Tottenham have been financially outmuscled on big on big significant players, I mean, I'm not expecting Tottenham to go and, you know, to be part of the conversation for Mbappe or who, <laughs> whoever the next Mbappe is. Calm down, Jack. Yeah, <laughs> or, who, you know, whoever the next kind of Mbappe, Bellingham yeah. type player is going to be sort of three to five years' time from now. But I am expecting Tottenham to be able to throw their weight around a little bit more with with very, very good players mm. because they've got that space to expand into and lots of other Premier League teams yeah. are, looking, are looking at their accounts thinking, can we afford him? Or if we can afford him, are we going to have to sell player X, player Y and player Z? I feel like I really like PSR in, in the sense that from a purely like biased Tottenham perspective, what fans have been sold for a very long time is sustainability for the sake of a brighter tomorrow. Like we're going to live conservatively so that we can afford to do these things um we're building a stadium so that we can we can have the we can go to the sunlit uplands of you know big transfer spending and it's good because like over those really two decades what what you've seen is like benefactor clubs leapfrog spurs because someone's come in and they're willing to foot the bill for um players or resources which would otherwise be beyond the club's means and so if there's a I, I'm not trying to point and laugh at clubs who are sort of suffering as a result of this, but if you live within your means for a club, I suppose, you should have this opportunity. That is the way it should work. And mm-hmm. it's it's kind of an alleviation of what has been a very long-standing frustration. And um, that's my fan hat, not a journalist hat. It's mm-hmm. just, that's that's generally just how I feel about it. It's uh, It feels fairer. I'm, I'm really interested in another um, factor that um, Charlie wrote about. Um, I think the piece went out in February on... Postacoglu's approach when it comes to hiring as well, because I think that's going to be a quite a really fascinating factor in terms of this idea. Even if you look at the January, Timo Werner, Dragosan, um, and that he actually has a real connection with the people he's trying to bring into the club. Um, Charlie talks about the fact that he, he, you know, he spoke to these players over the phone and he really convinced them of of what he wanted from them within the team structure, but also how he sees them fitting into this whole ethos and his approach. How important is that going to be over the, the, the summer periods when you're looking at these signings that you might want to poach away from the likes of Barcelona or whatever? I think it's really important. So I think fundamentally players want to players want to feel wanted. They want to mm. feel like they have a chance to to belong and also to grow in an environment. And you can see this by the number of players who've specifically chosen to come to Tottenham. So in the, over the last so last summer, for example, Newcastle United were very interested in James Madison. Newcastle obviously in the Champions League this season. Tottenham not not in any European competition at all, but he ended up at Tottenham. You know, um, Dragosin famously in the January transfer window had a, a much better financial offer to go to Bayern Munich. Yeah. You know, Bayern, if he'd gone to Bayern Munich, again, he would have been he might not have been first choice to play, but I mean, he hasn't started a game for Tottenham so far, so that would have been on his mind. Mm. And yet, even though he had this fantastic financial offer from Bayern, he chose to come to Tottenham. 
um, Bergval, who they've just signed from Dior Gardens in, in yeah. Sweden. Mm -hmm. Barcelona had not, yeah. I believe Barcelona gave him the, the full tour of the new camp. And again, you might have expected that a few years ago, a young player from from a, uh, from a league in Europe would be desperate to go to Barcelona. There wouldn't be a else. conversation with that a exactly, couple of years yeah. ago. And now he, he's going to Tottenham. So I do think Tottenham are increasingly popular. And I do know that, well, I don't know what conversations took place between Bergval and Tottenham. I do know in the case of Dragosin, he had what, two conversations on the phone with Postacoglu while he was trying to make up his mind. And it went down to the, it, you know, it was a very late run thing. I think it was only at 3 a.m. on it was 3 a.m. the morning before he decided that they finally got the call saying that uh, Jenner and Tottenham had done a deal so he could, in fact, go to Tottenham. Mm -hmm. But that emotional connection does really matter and players do want to come and play for him. Do you think Postacoglu gets the same respect as potentially the likes of Jurgen Klopp or the likes of uh, Mikel Arteta? You know, you've got the Guardiola connection. He's a guy that came from the, you know, the Australian league and then obviously did great stuff at, at Celtic. Frankly, no, uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, in Klopp's case, you had not just a, a Bundesliga winner in a Champions League finalist but you had a essentially a high priest of the game mm -hmm. um, someone associated with a very distinct tactical style with, uh, with someone like Arteta you know I have a really really excellent playing career mm -hmm. but you have this sort of halo patronage with Pep Guardiola mm -hmm. like by being in Pep Guardiola's presence the assumption is you become a Guardiola mm -hmm. in your own right eventually mm -hmm. whether that's true or not I don't know but um, Arteta is clearly off to a very strong start whereas I think in a way the attitude towards Posta Coglu describes the public's attitude towards modern football, where our focus is all on a single narrow area, which is the Premier League, um, with an almost, well, well, yeah, with a disregard for anything achieved elsewhere. So he wins in Japan, so what? Don't care about Japanese football. He wins in, in Scotland, yeah, but it's with Celtic. Like, no one seems to, beyond very few people, seems to want to dig down into kind of what went well. Like, um, if you talk to my good friend John McKenzie, a TIFO, raved about Ange Postacoglu before he'd um, before Tottenham was even a possibility he talked about kind of the innovations in his tactical style and the the brand of football that he was teaching and I don't think we we think of the game in that way very often I think it's trophies sound bites personality and that's really it um, and that maybe that that's fine because football's entertainment and you know not everybody is a football journalist right so you don't have time to kind of watch Japanese football every every weekend but um no and I, I don't think so it requires to to gain that respect i think you do have to win in a major league in 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 the premier league or or something or an equivalent um and he's yet to do that until that point he's a kind of an interesting tactical figure and a like a really likable human being but then the, um you know the public at large will, will always um favor someone who's won in a more obvious environment yeah i mean is that is that enough and being a likable human being if inevitably you're not winning the trophies you know that's that's what you're judged on especially in the premier league you know people want to see that this incredible brand of football that you've built slightly dangerous n let's not forget is actually a, a bit of madness that's bringing some into the game that we've never seen before if he doesn't win trophies surely that would be counted against him no I don't think so. Just because no no Tottenham manager has won has won trophies since Juan de Ramos, Fair and enough. that didn't save him. So I think Tottenham. I think look if they continue to improve, I think there will come a point in let's say two or three years' time when people say, "Isn't it time you won a trophy, Ange?" As with the Pochettino, it, exactly. Yeah, but yeah. for now, I think he's still in he's still in a place where he's going to get judged on firstly. The, the kind of ethos, cultural improvements we talked about earlier. And secondly, the sense that the team is improving on the pitch. But right now, I think he's he's ticking both of those boxes. So I think the trophy di discussion is kind of for another day. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I've always thought the trophy discussion is a bit more of a social media chat than a kind of a football world conversation. Like Pochettino did great things at Spurs, didn't win a trophy, didn't stop getting, uh, didn't stop him getting the Paris Saint-Germain job or, mm -hmm. or getting appointed mm -hmm. by Chelsea. I think it's a little bit of an illusion. I think people inside the game are pretty good, generally speaking, at applying context to managerial performance. And at the moment, that's that's where Postacoglu is. I don't. The trophy thing seems a kind of. I like it, but <laughs> you know, it's it's sixteen years, yeah. so it doesn't. Yeah. It's not at the forefront of my mind. Okay, probably. let's move on. Um, Jurgen Klopp um, is leaving the Premier League at the end of the season, and Guardiola still yet to be known whether he's going to sign another. 
extension uh, to his Manchester City deal at this moment in time. There are a few teams knocking on that door um, to try and break into that top three or potentially challenge for, for the Premier League. Aston Villa being one of them. And can we put Spurs in that category as well? Um, I think, yeah. I mean, I think it's very difficult to know what next season's going to look like in the mm. Premier League, right? Because a Klopp-less Liverpool, yeah. is, I mean, who knows? Mm. I mean, it could be a situation where they've got this momentum from this season, the young players, and they just ride that positivity through. Or it could be very, very difficult for them, you know, because of the the kind of the sense of a come down, the the sense of not having the man yeah. who everything's coherent around. So it's almost impossible to guess. And even even with City, like I don't, I just don't know what Guardiola's going to do. There's still a small part of me that wouldn't be surprised if, particularly if City go on to win a lot this season, no. as, as I think yeah. they might well. That he stays on. No, that he that he might go. Oh, interesting. This is, okay. I mean, this is this is just a pure hunch on my part, mm. but. I do wonder if they do if they win a lot, then I wonder if Guardiola might think he wants to go and play golf with Klopp next season. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask, what, what, what do you think is next for Guardiola? Like, if he were I, to I choose to know. do that, I, I, it's very really hard to, it's to very understand. It's very hard to know what job he could go to because I feel like this has been a job that has been kind of built around him. It's yeah. been kind of tailor made for, yeah. for him. So I, j- I just don't know what Pep would do next. But I, in terms of how Spurs could do in this new environment, well, I mean, I think they. I think they would need more play. I mean, it would still for them to challenge for the league next season mm. would be a hugely accelerated plan. I think mm. again, going back to, to Charlie's excellent article, you know, Klopp Klopp took over Liverpool in October 2015. Yeah, they became this close to winning the Premier League in 1819, but they didn't win the league until 1920. Arsenal, sorry, Arteta took over Arsenal in what de- December 2019. Mm. Again, they came very close to winning the league in 2022, sorry, in 2023, but they didn't. And now they're in the mix to try and win it in 23-24. We, we don't know how that's going to play out yet. So the time between a manager taking over and then actually winning the league like that's a that is a even if you're a brilliant manager with a lot of backing, it takes a long time. Yeah, do you know I'm going to pick up from what what Jack just said. Um, in terms of Spurs, and we've let's take Arsenal for instance. You know, in this respect, they've only just started feeling okay and feeling okay with dealing with the pressure of being the team to beat. Do you think this Spurs team are ready to deal with that pressure if they're going to gun for you know number one, number two spot? of being the team to beat? No, I don't think so. I think a lot of these players are yet to go through that situation. I think obviously Arsenal will be tremendously disappointed with what happened last year, Mm. but it did them good. I think um, lessons have been learned. For Spurs, I think think if you compare Arsenal and Tottenham directly, a lot of it comes down to, you know, cohesion in the attacking third. Like Arsenal look very, very well oiled at the mm. moment. They, they, they're very slick. They're, they're kind of, their horizontal movement of the ball is really impressive. I hate to say it, but it is. Mm. Um, and I think that's partly, a, you know, a, a function of, like, coaching performance. Mm. It's also they've made good investment in key areas. So, like, they, they have a situation where, obviously, you've got young players developing at a pace. Bukai Saka's become a wonderful, world-class player, clearly. Mm. Martinelli is lethal in, in certain situations. But they've also added players who are truly impactful. Trossard is one who, when they signed him, I thought, mm-hmm, I don't know about that. You, you heard noises about Trossard that made you think, you're going to sidestep that a little bit. Um, and yet they have this variation which allows them, because they face low blocks on a, on a, on a regular basis, to kind of pick their way through. Mm. Spurs are still kind of coming up against some of those challenges for the first time, some of these, these players individually. And the squad isn't quite equipped to show enough or, or to create enough problems for those sides. And um, so I don't think it's even at a stage where it's a question of emotional resilience. I think it's a kind of a, a tactical variation issue. Mm-hmm. But then that's part of the process, right? Like everybody's in this for the long term and you've got to you've got to allow these things to play out. Like Arteta's, Arteta's second season was no good, really. Mm-hmm. Like long periods of really poor form. And it's about... It's about growing and allowing yourself to grow through that kind of adversity. Spurs yet to do that. Yeah, Jack, we've talked about the future, and this is predominantly what this section of the pod is really about. Personnel are key, you know, not just players, but behind the scenes as well. I see Johan Langers coming into Spurs. Um, how important do you think those appointments are going to be if, if we're talking about, in terms of recruitment particularly? I mean, it's so, so important to be able to pick those right players, not just that, but also having a club structure as we've seen with the likes of Arsenal, as we've seen with other teams, even Brighton to a certain degree. Um, 
to be able to propel that team forward with a, a clear idea and a clear ethos? Yeah, I actually think recruitment teams might be slightly overrated mm -hmm. in the sense that Tottenham had a brilliant summer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Vicario, incredible signing. Frankly, not brilliant. a lot of people had heard brilliant of him. Player, yeah. but he comes in from Empoli and he he manages to square the circle of being a fantastic shot stopper and also really good with his feet so he can play Angeball. Van der Fen, fantastic. Like, again, integral to playing Angeball. Madison, you know, not... a not a surprise to anyone, really, who's watched the Premier League over the last five oh, years. I, I was a bit surprised. But he's come in and done really, really well. Uh, he's, he's a much better player than I thought yeah. he was. Yeah. So those three were really good. Spurs didn't have a recruitment team in the summer. <laughs> the recruitment the, re the recruitment <clears throat> team, such as it was, was Fabio Paratici, no longer a Tottenham employee, mm. who'd been banned from football but was in, allowed to work, we, should, we have to say, in this particular role, as a kind of ad hoc consultant. You know, Johan Langer didn't come in until October. So they had Paratici... Um, helping out, let's say, on recruitment in the summer. And they would, did it fantastically. And that makes me think, do you actually need a recruitment team? <laughs> or can you just have one guy with a big contacts book and a good eye for a player who working closely with the chairman and the manager? And you sign some, some really good players. So I, I, I don't know how it's going to go in the future with, with Johan Langer and his team. I've got no reason to, to think that they won't be good at their jobs. But... I, I think if you just got somebody who can pick the right players, then maybe we, we overcomplicate things a bit. Do you, do you think we're, we're kind of a little bit enamoured with guru culture? Like the idea of this kind of almost soothsaying technical mm -hmm. director who can just pick players out of nowhere. Whereas in reality, when we moved to Germany, I found out that like, unlike England, you can kind of develop relationships with people in those positions. They're a little bit more open in talking to journalists. Mm -hmm. And invariably, the people that are good at their jobs, they're just really good communicators and they understand how to work processes. That It's not like... I can spot the next Ronaldinho on a park pitch. It's not that. Yeah. And I think we've kind of gone a bit far down the down that path when we, we start talking about kind of like you sign a technical director and we sort of portray it as being kind of transformative in a way that very rarely is. There aren't many examples of that happening, or at least not when there aren't other pieces in place to, to kind of square the circle. Okay, well, let's end it there. And I've got to say good news for Spurs. Uh, manager of the Year, well, London Manager of the Year, and Postacoglu at the London Football Awards and uh, Goalkeeper of the Year, Vicario as well. So well done. Maybe a sign of things to come. Gents, thanks so much for your time. Jack and Seb, don't forget to rate and review the podcast. And we'll be back with another episode tomorrow. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>